Hi everybody, my name is Emma, this is Emma Rosenbooks, and today is the first video in a series all about how to write and publish your own children's picture book. Now the reason that I've made this video series is because I have written and published my own children's picture book. This is Lily the Limpet Gets Lost, I'll obviously link it below, and the book trailer as well. And this comes out on the 12th of September 2019, so that's in like two days time. <laughs> um, and I wanted to share the experience of everything that I've learned doing that, put it all together in a series so that if you're looking for ideas on how to write and or publish your own children's book, then you can find the resources here. Um, so this first video is all about how to write the book. I'm particularly focusing on writing in rhyme because Lily the Limpet is written in rhyme. So however, if you haven't written a rhyming book, there will still be things in this video to help you out. So don't go anywhere. <laughs> you can still find things that are useful on here. Now today's video applies to both indie writers and to traditional published writers. Some of the other videos are going to focus more on indie writing. Uh, it, you know, so it depends on what you're doing as to which of these videos are going to be useful to you. But I'll put them all in a playlist on my channel once they've all been uploaded. So step one is to have an overarching concept. Now Lily the Limpet has got a series concept as well as one for the book because it's part of a series called Seaside Stories. It's the first in that series. And the series, the concept behind that is to highlight creatures that don't seem massively exciting. So looking at things like shellfish or fish that aren't massively colourful or the kind of things that you find in rock pools and highlighting what's interesting about them and how important they are. Because I think in children's books you get an awful lot of your dolphins and your angel fish and your clownfish and, you know, the pretty things. <laughs> and I wanted to write books about the things that maybe aren't quite so exciting on the face of things. So Lily the Limpet is the first in that series and the idea with Lily is that it would tell a little bit about the ecology of limpets, some of the interesting things about the way that they live, and also with a positive message about the environment, but without being too educational or preachy, just to be a nice story, but to have those messages underlying. So whatever your book idea is, make sure that you know the overall idea. You might want to write it down, and if you do, keep it to one or two sentences. So it's just a broad idea. It means that you can focus what you're doing if you get a little bit stuck or unsure and kind of look back, oh yeah, that was that was what I wanted the project to do. So why is it out there? What's the point in it? And try and get that down into a simple explanation. Step two is to start looking at the structure of your book. So before you start writing anything, you need to think about how it's going to be laid out. Now, traditionally speaking, children's books are 32 pages long. They're not always, but it, to do with the way that they're printed and the way that, as far as I understand it, they're printed onto big sheets, which are then cut down. Um, and so, and, and the way sort of they're stuck together, doing it in 32 pages just became a very quick and easy way to do it that brought down the price of children's publishing and printing, I believe. So um, what I would suggest is go and look at some children's books. So for me, I raided my children's book collection, um, or you might go to the library, have a look at loads of children's books, count how many pages there are, and look at the page, how many they've got for the story, and then how many they've got for things like the copyright page, or the title page. So for instance, with Lily, there's a this book belongs to page to start it out. And then you've got the copyright page. And then you've got a second title page. Bear, bear in mind, you might want to sign the book. And so you might want to leave some space to do that. Often in children's books, there are actually two title pages. So you get one that's often quite colourful, and then a second one that's less so. Um, but look at as well, some of them have the story starting on uh, like the second page of a double page spread. Others, like with Lily the Limpet, go in for a full double page spread. Some of them finish with a double page spread or some of them go over to a single page. Some of them have pages at the end. You might include things like about the author and stuff like that. So think about how many pages you want your book to be. That will allow you to think about how many double page spreads you want, 
and also what those extra pages are going to be. Now initially my book was going to be 32 pages, it's actually 28. Uh, I took out my bits on about the author, I also had some fact pages about Limpet and it was all great but the reason that I took it out was because it I couldn't get the formatting to look right with the artistic feel of the rest of the book. So that's why my book ended up being a little bit shorter than that. But there's no reason why your book can't be 28 pages long. Another thing to consider when you're figuring out how many pages your book is going to be is that generally speaking printing is done in multiples of four so let's say your book ends up being 30 pages long well that's not divisible by four so you might find that when it is published uh, when it's printed rather that a couple of pages are added onto the end because also KDP and Ingram Spark like to put a little barcode on the back page the back page has to be blank so if you haven't allowed for that then they will want to add a couple of pages to be able to do that um, or to be able to print it easily by making it a multiple of four so try and consider all of those things now the reason for that is because you are going to decide how many pages are going to be made up by your story. So I decided right from the beginning that Lily the Limpet was 12 double page spreads. Tends to be like 12, 13, 14 double page spreads. That then allows you to divide the story up and allows you to write it without then having to do a rewrite because you've got the wrong number of pages. So then I'm there with my 12 double page spreads that I've decided on and I literally wrote on a piece of paper, one to 12, <laughs> and I thought about how my story was going to evolve and try to break it down into 12 steps. So this just allows you to know what's going on each page and it might be that you can only think of 10 events, obviously it depends if you've got a different number of page threads, um, and that you might have a larger event that runs over two pages, two double page threads that is, or however it is, but it allows you to get down in your head what's going to happen on each page. Of course with a picture book you're also thinking about the art that's going to be on each page, so having in the back of your mind how is that page going to look, how are the pictures going to be. It all sounds very complicated but it allows you to just kind of be uh, methodical and structured about the way that you're setting things up. So like I said I've then got those 12 divisions with just a couple of words or a sentence saying what happens on each double page spread, which then allows me to continue with the writing. So step three is the first draft. Now in your first draft, I would personally start out with just playing with those ideas, so your 12 or however many sentences that you've put out. So play with writing a little bit for that, that idea. The reason I'm saying that is you might want to play with different um, rhyming structures, if you're going to rhyme it, uh, you might want a different number of lines, a different rhythm, see how it comes out. It very much is that draft stage. Um, I would also say that as you're doing that, don't focus on getting it to rhyme. It doesn't really matter at this point because you can make it rhyme later. What matters is getting the story out and playing with the words because you'll start to find nice little sentence structures or um, you know nice rhymes as you go without forcing it and it also enables you to get the story down and come up with ideas without just just without focusing on the the, the poetic beauty of it if you have flashes of inspiration of a beautiful bit of poetry then write that in but see how it goes now I ended up doing um, eight lines on each double page spread with rhyming couplets but see how you want to do it, obviously there's lots of different structures of poem, see how you feel. So as I say, at this point it's very much just get your ideas down, don't worry about rhythm, don't worry about rhyme, um, I would say do worry about the number of lines that you want so that you can make sure there's enough content on each page, but other than that it's really just kind of a brain dump. Then step four is when you start editing, and this is your rewrite to start to get the poem to work. Now of course if you're not writing in rhyme, then, then that doesn't matter, but you're still going to be editing to get it to flow right and sound nice. Um, so some tips from my point of view. First of all, I used a website called Rhyme Zone, which I will link below. I really liked Rhyme Zone. Rhyme, Rhyme Zone, maybe saying like Rhizomes, you know those little things on legumes that you learn about GCSE? Anyway, Rhyme Zone, uh, what you can do is write your word in, so let's say you want to rhyme curtain, you <laughs> write curtain in there and then you will get all of the words that rhyme with it that are one syllable, two syllable, three and so on. So you can 
look for words that you like that are suitable to the story so for me it might be things that are sea creatures um or nautical in some way um you then can think about the rhythm of the sentence and whether you need something that's one or two or three or four syllables. So I really like that, but the thing that really sold me on Rhyme Zone is the fact that they have a near rhyme tab. I really like near rhyme. Sometimes when you use an actual rhyme, it sounds too forced and cliche. And sometimes a near rhyme sounds much more beautiful. Also, sometimes there isn't a perfect rhyme that fits your story, but there's a near rhyme that does. And so if you click the near rhyme tab on Rhyme Zone, what you'll get is um, the words listed by how much they rhyme. Uh, so you can start at the top and then as you get further down they get more and more <laughs> strange. It, but it means that you've got lots more options. If you can't think, obviously sometimes you'll just think of something that rhymes, but sometimes you can't think of it. And rather than sitting there going, curtain, certain, you know, trying to do that thing, <laughs> then you can get a list up. There are other websites that do this, by the way, and sometimes there were words that were listed on other websites. I did use others um, where I couldn't find something I liked and see if something else came up with a different rhyme. But it just made it really helpful to be able to see all of the words that rhymed and be able to pick something that was suitable. It also means that sometimes when there isn't a word that's right, that you can decide to maybe not use curtain and maybe use drapes instead. <laughs> or, you know, or maybe restructure it. So the end word isn't curtain, it's window. Or, you know, to just change things around so that you can then find a rhyming pair that works rather than forcing it um, or having something that just isn't even a near rhyme, it just doesn't rhyme. Of course, if you're writing a poem that doesn't rhyme, then that's different. Other, now, the other important thing to think about at this stage is rhythm. Now, in children's books, they generally do follow a rhythm when it when it's a poem. It's not quite such a, like, avant-garde structure. Um, so it's really important to ensure that your rhythm works. And sometimes it really bugs me when children's books have not got, like, a line suddenly runs out of rhythm. And it means that when you're reading it as a parent, you stumble over it, or the child will stumble o over it. In fact, I have a book that's you know, a really well-known newish release that where there's one line that's out by one syllable and it bugs me every time. <laughs> so think about the rhythm. Does it actually read, does it flow correctly? The way that I would go about doing this is first of all, read it out loud. If you stumble over the, the, the rhythm, over the pattern of it, then something's wrong and you need to readdress that. You can even go so far as clapping it out. Now, I have a, like a musical background, so I was even going as far as saying, mm, no, I don't want quavers there, I want a triplet or, you know, whatever. Um, but you can actually think about the rhythm and try and make sure that it does follow it. The other thing to do is to get other people to read through it and see whether they stumble. Uh, but you want to make sure that it keeps a structure because in children's books that is generally what they do. They follow a, a pattern throughout the book. And if you find that one of your words is not falling into the, it doesn't fall correctly, then look at how many syllables it's got, look at where the emphasis is in the word and try and find another word that maybe suits better or restructure the sentence so that it does run better. Um, it will make it seem much more professional and much less cliched if it uses beautiful rhymes and if the rhythm is consistent. Step five then is your final editing. Now I must have read Lily the Limpet about 3,000 times. <laughs> Make sure that you are totally happy with the way that your rhyme, or if you're not rhyming, uh, your prose runs, that you're happy with your word use, that your word use is appropriate for your audience depending on whether you're aiming at, you know, an, a naught to five uh, age range, maybe not three to five, uh, five to seven, or however it's aimed, that you're using words that they're going to know what they mean, um, and that, yeah, it just sounds lovely. Um, what you also need to do at this point is make sure that the grammar is correct. Uh, now you may wish to use an editor, there are lots of children's editors out there. If you're traditionally published, then your publishing house will provide that. If you're an indie, then you will need to find an editor. I'll link to a video where I talked about choosing an editor for my adults book. On this project, I decided to edit it myself. If you do that, make sure you know what you're doing. But something that I found really useful was to use Grammarly. Now, Grammarly is free, but it does have subscription 
deals, I use the free version. And so any things where I wasn't sure what the grammatical rules are, and for example, I really struggle with um, conjunctions and whether you need a comma. So looking at whether things are independent or dependent clauses. So the thing there is on Grammarly, there are articles. So there's an article on do you need a comma before and, and you can have a look and see what kind of sentence you've got and whether you do need a comma or not. Uh, alternatively, you can copy your text, make it run as if it were prose. So take out any um, line, like new lines and any capitalizations and make it into a sentence and drop it into Grammarly and see what it throws up and whether there are any issues. Make sure that it is spelt correctly, punctuated correctly, that you have done all of that absolutely beautifully. Make sure you get other people to read it. Uh, you may want to ask family and friends, but you may also want to use uh, beta readers. It depends on your project and what you intend to do, but make sure that other people eyeball it and people who are not afraid to tell you if they think something is wrong and people who do know how to spell and use punctuation and grammar. So make sure that it is absolutely perfect and beautiful at this stage. At that point, you're either going to be submitting it to an agent or a publisher, or you're going to be publishing it yourself. In either way, your manuscript needs to be as perfect as you can get it. I hope that you found that useful. If you have any tips or tricks on how to write your own children's book, please do leave them below. I love it when the comment section becomes help for each other. Um, let me know if you're writing any exciting project or anything like that. Uh, please do like if you did. Subscribe for more videos about writing and also about books and what I'm reading at any given time. And uh, don't forget that there will be other videos in this series, so like I said, once they're all out there will be a playlist on my channel and I'll make sure to link it below as well. My next video in the series will be all about how to illustrate your book, whether that be finding an illustrator or illustrating it yourself. I hope that you all have a lovely day and I will see you all soon for another video. Take care.